Realty Success Hub. We've got a great show for you here today with some really fun and amazing people. Can't wait to introduce them to you. Um, if we could run around the room right quick with a quick introduction, starting with you, Angela, tell us a little bit about you and uh, why you're here today. Well, hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm Angela Brown. I'm out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I run a company called Savvy Cleaner, and we are an international training company for house cleaners and maids. Um, there is no home that is sold or purchased without somebody coming in and doing a move-in or a move-out cleaning. I'm the author of the book, uh, The Ultimate Guide to Move-In, Move-Out Cleaning. Every homeowner needs a, a copy of this. It's got checklists so that you don't miss anything and you get the most amount for your sale. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you, Angela. And Brooke, how about you? Where are you, uh, where are you from today? Hey, Erin. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Brooke Bryant. I'm a realtor in and around the Charlotte, North Carolina area, and I love working with all facets of real estate. But my passion is working with first time home buyers. And I also have a book and it is the ultimate guide for first time home buyers. And it kind of walks anyone through the steps of what it takes to start your journey onto being a homeowner from credit repair, saving for a down payment, all different kinds of loans. So i uh, got that information in there and I'm so excited for today's show and learning all about uh, what everybody's got going on. Thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. And both of your books are phenomenal, by the way. Uh, thank you for putting those together for us. Regina, my business partner here, would you introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Regina Brown. I am a luxury realtor here in San Antonio, Texas. So anyone who's looking to buy or sell here in San Antonio, I would love to help you out. Thank you for having me on your show. Fantastic. Thank you. And we've got Grant Mueller today, who is not only an author, but a business coach and entrepreneur. And we are so, so excited to have you here today. We've got a ton of questions for you. Maybe you could give us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got started. Sure, Aaron. Um, so I'm Grant Muller. I am a realtor in the Denver market. I run a small team there. And I also wrote a book. It's called Top of Heart, How a New Approach to Business Saved My Life and Might Save Yours Too. And uh, I've been in real estate since 2008 when I started at the front desk of a real estate office. Uh, so I'm happy to share a little bit of that story. That sounds like a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I, I know that you actually had become a millionaire by the time you were, what, 30? Mm. Is that the case? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and sure. how you started. Sure, so I uh, started in corporate America in my early 20s. And, uh, well, let me go back just a, a little bit so that you can have some context. I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. And so uh, we moved here when I was seven and I talked funny. I had a funny accent. And in middle school, that's kind of cool. In second grade, not so much. So I was immediately ostracized and I learned very quickly how to pretend to be like the other kids to fit in. And that's what I did all through elementary school. I just kind of took on the role of pretending to be like the other kids. And I discovered alcohol in middle school. And it turned out to be a great way to help me to kind of pretend with myself and with other people and to continue to fit in. And so by high school, I was drinking every single day. And I was a daily drinker. I took driver's ed under the influence. Uh, <laughs> test under the influence. So um, you're a rebel. Kind of scary. Could have been a terrible time. Uh, luckily, luckily everybody was safe. Uh, but as I moved into my early 20s, I gave up the alcoholism for the workaholism. Uh, I liked those side effects just a little better. And I ended up at Charles Schwab for a number of years, um, built a good uh, career there as a leader. And then I ended up at an internet startup. This is the late 90s. And we went public. Uh, we all got rich. Porsches and Ferraris started showing up in the parking lot. And uh, it was really cool. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner was catered. I had a foosball table right outside my office. This is before Google. But I remember the night that we had gone public on the stock exchange. I was sitting in my fancy condo overlooking the skyline of Denver thinking, is, is this it? It was a really empty feeling. Have you ever felt like you killed yourself for a goal you've always wanted? 
and then you get it and realize that maybe it's not the right thing for you. Uh, I had just been pretending to be someone else this whole time. And so it didn't even feel like my win. And it didn't, the money hadn't solved the major problem I had, which was that I was not okay with myself. And so I started drinking again. And a few months later, I was in a hotel suite. I'm sorry, I'll try to wrap this up quickly, but I just want to give you the background. Uh, so uh, a few months later, it was 1999, and I was in a New Year's, uh, it was New Year's Eve. I was in a hotel suite in San Francisco, pre-gaming pretty hard with a friend of mine. We were drinking pretty hard. And at one point, he pulled out some cocaine. And I tried it without thinking. It was the first time I'd ever done drugs, and I loved it. Uh, it was like it was like the answer to all of the problems I'd ever had my whole entire life. For the first time ever, even after drinking, I felt like I belonged with myself. I felt like everything was going to be okay. And within a few weeks, I was using Coke every day. And within a few months, I was fired from that internet startup job. And I thought, no big deal. I'm 28. I've got over a million dollars in stock options. I'm not fired, I'm retired. And so I continued to party and now I was able to party full time every day. I was spending about $30,000 a month on cocaine, uh, alcohol, trips, parties. And one day one of my checks bounced because when you're partying like that, you don't sit down and balance out your check register. Um, in fact, to be honest, I still don't. Uh, but uh, I called to exercise more shares. That's what I always did. I said, hey, I got more. This is Grant Muller. I'm calling to exercise more shares of stock. And they said, there are no shares in this account. And I said, there should be about 16,000 shares. I'll hold while you figure out uh, what your error is. And she came back on the line and said, well, actually, you had 90 days after leaving the firm to exercise your shares or forfeit them. And so in that moment, I lost $1.2 million um, and I hung up the phone and I looked around the room and I thought, it's something needs to change. You know, I, need, I really need to get a hold of my life and make, make a change. This is going to be the moment for me. So the change I did is I sold all the cars and I turned the cars into cash and I took the cash and I bought more Coke. And by the end of the week, the cars were gone, the cash was gone, the Coke was gone, the party friends were gone, except one friend. And he was willing to hang out and help me finally kick the Coke habit. I really knew, knew I needed to get rid of the addiction once and for all. And so he introduced me to, um, to meth. And things got a little darker from there. Um, within a few months, the condo was foreclosed on. And I spent the next few years on the streets um, selling meth to support my habit and really violating every value I'd ever held. Um, at the very end, I was hiding in a crack house about two blocks from where I am right now, ironically. I'm hiding in a crack house from a gang leader who I owed money to who wanted to hurt me very badly. He had gang members looking all over town for me. I couldn't leave because I to get more money or drugs because they'd find me. And I couldn't stay because I knew somebody in there would end up selling me out to this gang leader. And so I gave up and um, I asked for help. And it's a much longer story. I'm trying to keep it short for you. But ultimately, um, I asked for help and I received it. And through a lot of privilege and a lot of luck, and what I believe is some kind of intervention from a divine um, source. I was able to get clean and sober and um, have been clean and sober since 2008 um, when I started in real estate. So um, I know that's a long answer to a short sure. question. We need to talk about that pivotal moment right quick because yeah. that, that really hits on a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. What was that pivotal moment and what made that change for you? So uh, it's a great question. And we all hear about those pivotal moments. And I would love to say that I had an inspiration to become a better person. And I raised my hand and said, I'm ready for something better in my life. But what really happened is I had no choice. My back was up against a wall. I was facing a four-year prison sentence or go to rehab. Those were my choices. And so I actually stopped. I was using for a long time against my will. And I stopped against my will. Um, if I could have kept going, I would have kept going, unfortunately. 
And so in my case, the criminal justice system and this gang leader who, um, he was a top FBI most wanted guy. Uh, or uh, So, I mean, he was a very, very dangerous human being. And so I probably wouldn't have survived it if he'd found me. Um, so, you know, it was literally the gift of desperation um, is how I got clean. And then I would add, uh, when I said there's a privilege in my story, I always like to highlight the fact that I had a family who had been looking for me that I had cut off because I didn't want them in danger. And so when I reached out to them, they were willing to help me. And I had a sister that ar had arranged with my probation officer to allow me to go to rehab instead of to jail. And there's a lot of privilege in that. I have a lot of friends who unfortunately either have not made it and aren't living anymore or that are still in prison because they didn't have that opportunity. And so I always like to point out that um, I got clean and sober with a ton of help and I stay clean and sober and do everything in my life with a ton of help. Um, and there's most of the stories in the book, but uh, that's, that's kind of the long and short of it, if that helps. That's an amazing journey. So you, you went through all of that and then how did you get into business? How did that start? How did you get that opportunity? I so, mean, You've left us hanging on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I'd always wanted to be in real estate. I had bought some investment properties earlier on, and I hadn't thought very highly of the realtors that had helped me. Um, they really didn't seem to give the same level of service that I was teaching my employees at Charles Schwab um, and that I was leading in the software company. And I've always had a passion for consumer service. And I thought, wow, if, if we could treat people a little bit more humanely, I bet you could build a really great real estate business. But I was never willing to give up my great incomes to do that. So it was 2008, and I was living in a storage unit, my first place off the streets. And I thought, you know, the market's at the very bottom. My life is at the very bottom. What better time is there to start a real estate career than now? Uh, I didn't have the money to take the test. And I was a server at Applebee's at the time. And I am the world's worst server, by the way. Um, <laughs> constantly getting nachos, the kinds of nachos mixed up. I mean, they all look the same to me. And uh, so I went to a local office and said, look, I want to be a realtor. Do you have any job I can take so I can just be around other realtors and start to learn this business while I study for my test? And um, I got a job at the front desk for nine bucks an hour. And I learned so much from that job, so much. And uh, so that's how I got into real estate. That's so how long, I'm sorry, how long did you keep that job at the front desk? I was at, I was at the front desk for six or nine months, somewhere around there. Um, I was also not a very good front desk person. It's not my, I am a, I'm a driven person. Um, so not, not the best personality to have at the front desk. Uh, but what happened pretty quickly is over time, agents started to figure out that um, I was eager to learn um, and I was somewhat smart. And so they um, asked me to become a transaction coordinator. And um, I started a little transaction coordination company um, called Transaction Guru. And uh, I learned so much. I, I knew from the start I was I was that was not going to be my strong point. I'm not a details guy, so I knew if I could do that really well, then I would be able to lead that really well in the future. And so um, I I did that for a little bit as I got my license, and then in 2009 I got licensed and um, had a pretty slow first year, like most agents do. It's, I'm not going to tell you I ran YouTube ads and made a million dollars my first year. It's certainly not my story. <laughs> I'm I'm so happy that you became a transaction coordinator first and foremost. There is so much to be learned from that job. And yes. it would be amazing if every realtor could do that for a few months before. Yeah. Um wow. What a what a fun way to get in and learn the business. You probably learned more in your first nine months, year than most realtors do in in their in their first five or six. Well, and so there were a couple of pieces there. Those are, and, and your language you just used reminded me. Um, so when I had my first clients, um, I also previewed like 
a crazy person. Now this was 2009, so it was easy. There was lots of stuff on the market and people were just desperate to get, let you in their house. So previewing was really easy. And I would see 10 to 15 houses on preview a day. And I would just go market after market after market. I'd say, okay, I'm a buyer, 800 to a million in Boulder. Okay, I'm a buyer, 600 to 900 condo here. And I would just do the searches and do the, do the previews. And so when I had my first clients, I could look them in the eyes and say, I know the market like the back of my hand. I see more property in a week than most agents see all year. And I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of transactions. Um, and so, you know, it, it gave me a little bit of a lift up because unfortunately at the same time, the truth was also, and I live in a storage unit, which, you know, most agents, most clients don't want to buy a house with somebody that lives in a storage unit. Uh, but, and then at the same time, there was this guy in Boulder who had given away all of his very, very high end shirts and suits um, to the Goodwill. And so for about a bucket piece, I bought these, I had these shirts that happened. He just was exactly my size. So I had like these custom French cuff shirts. <laughs> this is in Boulder. So I looked so overdressed, but it helped me stand out and it helped me feel a little bit more confident. So now was, now, now was that the story or, or did you get into his storage unit? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 I actually bought them. So it sounds like you you got into the business in a really uh, creative, fun way and learned more in the first year than most realtors will learn in the first five. Uh, something somewhere inspired you to write a book. So during the day, during the day, I'm doing real estate at night. I'm going to 12 step recovery meetings. And I'm learning thank how you. to get real. Thank What's that? For they said, thank you for going. Um, oh, it's sure. amazing yeah. you took that step and you were like, got involved in, in actual help to get you back on track. And that's yeah, amazing. I had, I, I had no choice. Um, you know, I, I knew I needed, and there are many ways to get the help that you need to be clean and sober and, um, different things work for different people. This is what worked for me. And, um, I knew that I needed to realize I'd been spending a lot of years, figuring out how to be a drug addict. I needed to spend a lot of time to figure out how to be a drug addict that doesn't use anymore. And so um, I was learning at night about getting real for the first time in my life and showing up as I really am. And what I noticed is when I showed up as I really was in these meetings, the community put their arms around me and supported me and said, hey, we know you know, you're, you're a sick, sick addict, just like us, you know, like we know that there's some shame here, but you're just like us, you know, and I would share these terrible things and they just nod their head like, yep, yep, we get it, we get it. And so for the first time in my life, I was being real and I became a part of a community and I belonged and I started to feel like I belonged with myself. During the day, I was taking real estate classes and I was learning things like the Ford call, Hey, how's the family? Hey, how's your occupation? How's the relation? How's the recreation? What are your dreams coming up? And then at the very end, the kicker. Oh, by the way, who do you know that might need to buy a house in the next six months? And I was being taught to make these phone calls and it felt so disingenuous. It felt like, gosh, I got to kind of pretend to be interested in them. And then at the very end, I got to tell them, oh, by the way, I wasn't really calling for any of that. The truth is, I just want you to buy or sell a house with me. And it felt so fake. And it just didn't feel right. And I thought, gosh, did I just get real for the first time in my life? And now I have to pretend to make friends with people so I can make it in this business? And it just didn't feel right. And it took a few years. But what I started to understand is that Top of mind marketing, which is the Ford call, for instance, which is postcards, um, is wonderful. It's really important that when somebody thinks of real estate, they think of us, that we're somewhere in the top of their mind. But what I started to discover is my raving fans, the ones who sent me referral after referral after referral, those people I had a deeper connection with. And it took me a few years later to figure out what is that deeper connection? How does that thing work? 
And that deeper thing is what I call top of heart. So I just believe that top of mind is great, but it's just not enough. We need to go from top of mind to top of heart. Go ahead. <laughs> My question is, how do we go from top of mind to top of heart? <laughs> so so uh, a couple of things. First of all, again, I, I never discount the top of mind piece. It's really important to make sure that we all get busy and we all get distracted. And sometimes we're victims of our own success. Because when we do this right, we get so busy, it's hard to really manage the things that take a lot of our time. So we need an automatic top of mind process to stay, quote unquote, top of mind. But to go top of heart, there are three pieces. It's mindset, skill set, and heart set. And in the book, I go through each one in great detail and actually give exercises because what I'm about to tell you can sound a little woo-woo, if you will. So I want you to know there are practical steps here to take. But the mindset is in what we just talked about, getting real. The mindset about being present with people. It's really easy for us to get so busy and to, to want to be in front of as many people as possible that we forget it's not about being in front of. It's about being with people. It's about being real instead of being relevant. And uh, so getting real, being present, being open to what's happening in the moment, being open to the relationship. I'll give you an example about open in a second and being helpful. So I was um, at an event for one of the hobbies I participate in and I was trying to leave out of the parking lot. I was in a big hurry and this lady stops me that I know and she starts talking to me and going on and on and on. And I'm thinking the whole time, let me go. I need to go to work. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm a big time realtor. Leave me alone. I don't say that, but I think that. I get in the car and I rush off to my next appointment and I reflect on the conversation and realize she was talking about her neighborhood. She was talking about real estate. But I was in this mindset where I wasn't open. I was just thinking I'm here doing this thing that I do for fun. It's not a part of, of real estate and keeping everything separate. And, uh, you know, she lives in a very high-end neighborhood. It, it was probably the most profitable conversation I could have had would be to continue the conversation with her. And so being open to the fact that um, each human being um, has something that we can share with them that would add some value for them and just looking for how we can add that value and not always being worried about the transaction. So that's mindset. It's about being open it's about being relational rather than transactional. So thinking about the length of a relationship not being determined by the length of the transaction. The transaction is just often the very beginning of the relationship. So that's relational versus transactional. That's mindset. That is so powerful. But I know lots of relational, authentic agents who still struggle month after month. And so as I built this framework, I thought, what if you show up as you really are and you're relational, but you suck? <laughs> and so I realized also we need a skill set. And I knew people were telling me early on I needed to be authentic, but I kind of felt like I did. I felt like I can't be authentic because I'm living in a storage unit and I've got, I don't know anything. And they're telling me to fake it till I make it, but I don't know my way in and out of the contract. So skill set was so important to me. And that's about building personal strength, growing our personal impact and influence, and then creating a culture of excellence. So making sure that we manage that piece of the, of the business. In top of mind, um, I think it was Zig Ziglar who said, all things being equal, people like to do business with those they know, like, and trust. But people always forget the be all things being equal part, and they just focus on the no like, and trust. We've got to focus on not only being equal in skill set, but being a little better than our competition in skill set in our own areas, right? So, um, you know, if you work luxury, then you might that might be your area where you want to make sure you're just a little bit better. So that's skill set. And then there's heart set. And heart set, quite simply, it's many things. Uh, but heart set is about getting intentional. And, and I'll give you an example. So in, in the 12-step recovery, we say, I can't, we can. 
So going from me to we, thinking about building a community around us of people that support us. My business is nothing without my clients. My business is nothing without their referrals. So really thinking about building a community and building an intentional, heart-centered, real emotional connection with people. So uh, as an example, if if I'm going out, uh, if I'm going to a closing with a first-time home buyer, and I know that they're super nervous, they're super scared about this big thing, in the parking lot for the closing, right before I walk in, I'll just take a quick snapshot of them in my mind. I call this the snapshot method for that reason. And I'll just picture them. And I'll think, how do I want them to feel at the end of this time together? And I'll think, well, in this case, they're really nervous. They're not sure they're doing the right thing. And they're going to have a ton of questions because they don't feel well equipped. And so I'll think, okay, I'm going to go in there with some confidence, some passion for what they're doing, and a lot of patience because they're going to have like 9,000 questions, of course. And so then I'm just thinking about how do I want this person to feel at the end of our time together? It's just about creating some intention. And when we do that and we see people as people, it just makes all the difference. And this doesn't have to be a really in-depth thing. If you think about it, I don't know if you've ever had a toothache over the weekend and you call your dentist on Monday morning and you say, this has been the longest weekend of my life. I have the worst toothache. Please help me. And they go, okay, sounds good. One moment while I check the calendar. And it's like, sounds good. It's been dreadful. And so top of heart can just be a moment where they might say, wow, that sounds like a terrible weekend. Hold on. Let me see what I can do to help you. Right. But it's just about not seeing people as numbers on our screens or calling them leads and dumping them into funnels. It's about treating people as people. That's heart set. Um, so, so that's in a nutshell, the framework of top of heart. It's just about bringing humanity into every business process, whether that's sales, service, leaderships, leadership, uh, business relationships and personal relationships, they don't have to be separate. Um, and all relationships start with the heart. Um, as well as the head. I I think that's such a great advice. Um, we are, for the most part, in the service industry, and I'm in real estate. And I can relate to the story you just said about the dentist. I, a couple of years ago, was planning a funeral and called the funeral home. And the, the point of contact that I spoke with was so chipper and upbeat and just, you, you know, it's like, what? Maybe that's not quite the tone that you should have as the yeah. gatekeeper of this, but yeah. um, but in real estate, there's so many relationships that we have to nurture, not just with our clients, but with the realtor on the other side of the transaction, yeah. uh, our transaction coordinators, the home inspector, appraiser, all of those relationships. So I think that's a really fundamental to keep in mind that we just don't know what the other person is dealing with right at that moment. So try, I like the snapshot. Let let me put myself in that position, consider what they might be feeling and how we can work to get the best outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I had a long list of things um, for my operations director to take care of this morning. But before I gave her that list, I asked her, how's your kiddo feeling? And It was a rough night, 104 fever, all those things that are scary. And so that list all of a sudden changed, right? I said, yes, I've got, I've got some things, um, but they're not time critical. Go, go to urgent care. Let me know when you're done. Right. It's just, it's just that little bit um, of change, but um, we have a hard, hard time with loyalty sometimes in this business on our teams. And um, I think it's about a human problem. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. (laughs) You touched on so many things here um, between skill set and leadership and really heartfelt connections. Talk to us a little bit on the leadership and skill set side on how you would encourage somebody to take that step and really start to develop themselves so they can get in a heartfelt space. Sure. Uh, The first thing I'll say is um, sometimes it gets confused and people think, you know, I don't want to make everybody my friend or, you know, I don't want to have this soft, gentle, lovey-dovey relationship with everyone. And that's not top of heart. Top of heart is just about having organic, genuine relationships. So what that means is 
Um, Kate, who's one of my clients, she's now one of my best, 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 best friends, best friends. But I have other clients who, you know, the most heartfelt way I can help them is to be efficient, to narrow down what they have to look at, help them find a house, get in and get out and they're done, right? That's another heartfelt way. So it's not always about, um, you know, making everyone our friends. I just want to make that really clear. From a leadership perspective, it's about understanding what our people really want. Like what drives them? Now, I believe that our people are our clients. Um, so they're just, they're just more clients. In fact, I think of everybody as my clients, um, my family, everybody. I think if I can serve people like I serve my clients, um, I'll have great relationships. <laughs> so, so that's how I think of it. But, but I think about it like an, a, an upside down pyramid. Uh-huh. So I'm at the very bottom. Um, and it's a little bit of a servant leader. Yes. I mean, some, I still make the decisions at the end of the day when I need to. So, um, it's not a, a commune, if you will. Um, it's still a little bit of a dictatorship, but I want everybody to have input and their, their, you know, success is on my shoulders, not the other way around. So I work for them. My job as a leader is to remove barriers that are in their way uh, from performing their best. Um, the other really, really critical part of my job as a leader is as a coach. And so I coach my people to really make sure that they're in the jobs where they can exercise their own unique, um, um, you know, miraculous work, if you will. We all have these talents. And so sometimes it means shifting people around within the team. And quite honestly, sometimes it means helping people find different places to work because it might not be a great fit. I always say helping people out or helping them out. Uh, <laughs> but, but I want everybody on the team to be engaged in the work um, that they've always wanted to do, or at least in the work that will be of service to help them get to the work that they've always wanted to do. Well, that reminds me, you've got a coaching program that's coming out. Tell us a little bit about that and what people can expect if they were to participate in that. I have a, I was coaching one-on-one for a while and I still do that from time to time and um, grantmuller.com, um, you can find me there. I speak and I coach and uh, I love one-on-one -on -one coaching. But what I found was somebody would say something and I would think, holy cow, I wish the rest of my clients had heard that. So I started doing some group coaching and people just absolutely love it. So I've created a 90 day program and I call it the 500 K realtor program. So if you're doing at least hundred in GCI a year, it's really made for you to go to 500 and beyond. And, and for those, those that are not understanding GCI, explain that to us. Uh, gross commission income. So thank okay. you for asking. So, you know, you, you should be making about hundred thousand dollars a year for, for this work to make sense for you because there, there are a lot of programs that are created for people who are a little newer and, and um, no judgment at all. That just a skill set that I'm not great at helping with, but if you're at hundred, I can help you get to 500. And in the 90 days um, we look at building a plan and a path to 500 that's built around how you want to work. It's not built about around what made me successful. It's not built around what I think is the best. It's built around what makes you successful because so many of us, have done coaching. I'm, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaches and I've learned so much and I've loved it. But what I've noticed is the programs are based on what that person prefers to teach. And so a lot of times I'm not consistently following through with the activities because they're not congruent with who I am and how I want to do my business. So I've built this so you can build a business around who you want to be. And then in my high performance coaching, I help you build the influence, the productivity, and create the energy you need and the influence to, to move forward with your dreams and to enlist people in your business building in the way that you want to do it. And of course, that top of heart framework, uh, we go through that in quite a bit of detail and install it into your business again in a way um, that you're super excited about. So the first, the first meeting, it's a two, it's 90 days. It's every Tuesday, uh, once a week for 90 days. And the first call is November 28th. 
Love it. That's so yeah. exciting. Yeah. It sounds like Zig Ziglar meets John Maxwell. <laughs> a little <laughs> bit. And if you've read The Go-Giver, um, Bob Berg, who wrote The Go-Giver, wrote the foreword to my book. Um, he is a major mentor of mine and hero of mine and friend. And uh, Bob helped a lot with my book. And a lot of the go-giver principles, if that's something that resonates with you, um, is also, you know, mixed into what we do. So um, that was but I appreciate a phenomenal that. phenomenal book. So yours has to be outstanding. <laughs> no, please. No, it's <laughs> not even close to that. But but yeah, it's, it's fun. No, what I love about all my takeaway from all that is, and you touched on it, is when you get into the real estate, and I'm sure so many other careers, that the path of success that's typically laid out for you very often doesn't feel authentic to a right. lot of people. Right. You know, you have to door knock or you have to call right. color, that sort of thing. And it's outside of a lot of skill sets or yeah. comfort zones for people. Right. And there's something to be said for stretching yourself outside of your comfort zone. But at the end of the day, you're going to fall back on what's inherent to you. And I love that you're able to find that and coach people through their particular skill sets and their talents and that you don't have to change who you are in order to be a success in the field you chose. Absolutely. I have a client who is, she's a, a runner just for fun, a hobby runner in Boulder. Um, and she started a running club and I call her the slowest, highest paid runner in Boulder because she makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year <laughs> from this running club. And so she gets to run for a living. I love horses. And um, I do a great amount of business, not just with horse properties, but for horse people who have properties. And uh, it's so cool because I get to go ride my horse and do what I love the most in the world and make a living doing it. So I think it's not, it's not versus, oh, I've got to go prospect for three hours this morning and do things I don't want to do. I just don't believe that's a life that any of us should be living unless you love doing that. Amazing. So I got a quick question for you. If yeah. uh, you went through this, and, and I'm going to call it sadness, because I think if you are addicted and you have a whole bunch of pain and you're wishing you were something different than maybe you are, I think that's I think that's sad. Sure. Do you think that sadness informed who you are today? And do you think you would be who you are today had you not gone through that? It's a great question. I'm so incredibly grateful for all those terrible years because it has created this life that is absolutely beautiful. Uh, yes, I was a millionaire before 30, but I was miserable. I was doing work I didn't care about. I was chasing money just because I thought that would make me feel better about who I was. Now I make more money than I ever thought possible back then. And I do it from a place of joy. I love what I'm doing. I get to earn a living helping other people grow whether that's as a realtor or as a real estate coach. And um, I would certainly not be here if that wasn't the case. I was sick enough, if you will, with addiction that I had to do a lot of work on myself um, to get to a place where I could get better. And I continue to do that work. I did that work this morning, um, you know, and I help others. So that work happens every day of my life. And so if we think about these businesses that we're in in service, we are the product that we're offering the consumer. And if we want to improve the product, we've got to improve our, ourselves. So you know, I always say personal development is business development. Our jobs are to get better as people. And then, of course, that spills over into a beautiful life with our family, our pets, whatever we might have. Um, but, but what a joy that is. So well, we're, getting, we're seeing a shift in real estate, right? Lots of things changing in real estate. And, um, and, we, and that, it is cyclical and it trends. You started in 2008. I can't even imagine starting real estate in 2008. And if anybody doesn't remember, that's the, the big crash. And it was it was a horrible time. And now we're seeing changes with increased interest rates and inventory levels. So do you think, um, and you talk about future-proofing your business through these relationships. So tell us, 
touch on that a little bit. How with the changes that we see in business, how these relationships are going to help you future proof your business. Great question. We're we're in this age of automation. Uh, AI is replacing more and more of the moving parts of the sales process, of the transactions. Once that transformation is complete, I think all that's going to be left is our ability to forge these real heart-centered human connections. That's something that AI cannot replace yet, <laughs> at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's important for us, rather than being forced and fake and tactic driven, to really lean into the relationships. And when we look at the exact market that we're in right now, I believe it's important more than ever for us to show up and be a sign of strength uh, for our clients and the people that are in our spheres of influence, what I call my community. Um, but it's important to be closer than ever. And it's really easy right now to look at that group of people and think, well, nobody's going to make a move right now. Um, but there are always reasons to make moves, uh, regardless of any market, right? Whether that's divorce or death. Um, that's the five Ds, but I always forget what they are. It's divorce, death, diploma. Anybody else got the other two? Um, there are five of them. I always forget one. I, I added the sixth one is dogs because people move all the time to get, get more um, dogs. But, but things happen in our lives and people need to move. And so it's important for us not to make assumptions about our, our people in our list, but instead to reach out to them and to make real connections with them. That, that sounds like it goes back a lot to the community that you were talking about and building a real community. Yeah. Maybe you could talk on that just a little bit from a realtor perspective. Yeah. When you're dealing with a lot of people and a lot of emotions and families and situations, how to build that sense of community and really bring people together, you know? So we can add value for people in many ways. Um, we can share our resources. We share our time. We can also share our connections. And when we share our connections, we create these amazing moments. I'll give you an example. I was coaching um, an agent this morning and we talked about how he can get involved in his community. Um, he doesn't have enough people that he's helping on and adding value to. Um, you know, he has about 50 people. And so one of his goals is to improve the quantity. And I said, yes, but let's also look at the quality of the people and make sure that they're people you want to spend time with. And usually the way to do that is to think about what are some things you love and then going to those things, just like you would to go find somebody, um, a soulmate, right? Um, if you love art, you go to art shows. So um, he, in his case, he loves, he loves the theater and um, he loves a couple of things. And I said, oh my gosh, I, I need to introduce you to this guy, Chris. Chris is on the board of this thing and on the board of this thing, and they both impact these two things you care about. And I love Chris, but honestly, I don't care about those things. So I never show up as at events. Maybe you need to go meet him and build this relationship. And then those two will hit it off like crazy because they have so much in common. And now it's a sense of community. But what I did is I expanded my sense of community by connecting them, right? Because what will happen is, quite honestly, the two of them will talk about me, of course. I'll become kind of, it becomes like the triangle of trust, if you will. And so now I've built each of those relationships are stronger because I've made this third thing called we, from me to we. And so that's an example of building community. I had to learn these things almost like an alien because I'm not built naturally to do this stuff. So I had to really break it down and say, well, what would a human do here? And I think that's why I've kind of learned this more human approach. But it took me a while because I've always been a little bit of that outsider. And so I had to learn how did people build community? And I just kind of broke it down and have been practicing it. But, you know, today, uh, you know, I, I could as long as I stay clean and sober, I cannot be homeless, even if I tried. You know, as long as, as, as I'm clean and sober, I will always have a place to stay anywhere in America um, because I built this community of people um, that I love and that love me. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's highly profitable. Yes. So would you say that a, a piece of 
an actionable step that people can take if you're looking to to grow in this way to focus on the things that you love and pour yourself into that and start making your connections there. So I want to answer your question very specifically because you brought up the market and now you're asking for an actionable step. So let me give you real like bare bones, bottom line tactics, um, something that I'm thinking about right now. Um, this is the moment in time where we do a few things. Number one, we do an expense audit. It's time to look at how we spend every single dollar in our business and hold every single dollar accountable. And there's some great tools online to look at those monthly subscriptions that are killing you. Um, but I think all of us should find $500 to $1,000 a month that we can remove from our expenses right now. Now's the time to tighten up. Let's take advantage of that. That's number one. Number two, looking at our income. Where has our income come from in the last 12 months? Where have our deals come from? And doing a deep dive there to really understand what's working for us and what's not. And then making sure that we lean heavily into that. Um, I'll give you an example. I spent about $16,000 once on some radio ads and it was a horrible flop. Um, I got one deal out of it and it was the DJ who did the ads. <laughs> so it was this relationship I built with her, right? And at the end of this, I got a referral from this financial advisor who I didn't spend much time with or pay much attention to. And, but I got the referral right after this had happened and I was feeling terrible about myself. And I looked back and realized, holy cow, this guy has given me six figures of referrals in the last 12 months. What if I invested my time and money and attention into that one relationship like I did with radio? So, but I didn't know that because I hadn't looked at my business or really thought about it properly. So in that 90 day program I just mentioned, those are some of the quick wins we're going to look for to make sure that we tighten stuff up um, and get rolling in the right direction right off the bat. Um, and then the last piece of tactical information is to very clearly go through our CRMs and make sure we cut out all the I'm going to be polite here, but there are some, there's for some, those, for those that are not familiar sorry, with the thank term you CRM. Much. Thank you very much. Um, customer relationship management, where we keep our groups of people. It's time to go through there, cut out some overcomplication that starts to happen in there and get down to some real, real human centered ways to look at those people and create a solid plan for how to connect with them and how to move those relationships forward. And spoiler alert, it's not mass anything. <laughs> it's the stuff that doesn't scale that usually makes the most difference. Oh, wow. Um, and that that's a beautiful line that I stole from a guy. Um, so it's not mine. Um, Chris, um, Chris Smith, um, and he runs Curator uh, as part of Curator, which is a software program. Um, so I want to give, I always like to give credit. But, but it's brilliant, right? Do things that don't scale. So the biggest marketing thing I do that makes me the most money and gets the highest response is on the 15th of every month, I look at the birthdays for the next month. I, pull, I go to my card library. I pull out a card for each of them. I write a handwritten card to each of them. Nowadays, my operations director pulls them out, gives them to me, and I just fill them out. It's easy. But I handwrite a message. Hey, Allison, thinking of you. Hope you have a great day on your day. Happy birthday. How many birthday cards do you get? Not many. And so um, the birthday card is a beautiful human touch, but it does something else. It tells the person, wow, they are on point because I got the card a few days before my birthday. They are organized people. They were really willing to go and buy the birthday card for me. They were able to go and scrounge through their desk looking for a stamp. You know, they assume that this is much harder because it's not a part of their process. So people really, really appreciate it. And it's such a nice touch. I'm never in a bad mood after writing, you know, 30 birthday cards. Always puts me in a great mood. So that would just be, those are some examples about how we stay top of heart with people, not just top of mind. Those are really, really good pointers. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, what an easy way to make that human connection. 
And you're right you, to get a birthday card in the mail. It just feels so good. And it, and it, and it hardly ever happens. It hardly ever happens. And so I love handwritten cards. Um, I have a stack of them on every, I have a couple of different real estate offices. So I have a stack of them on each of those offices and here in my coaching studio and um, at my home office. And I would just, and they're just easy. I just grab one, the envelope, it's, the card is stuck in the envelope. The pen is right there. The stamps are right there. So it's very easy and a low friction to send somebody a card, but it's high friction from their perception. So um, it's a beautiful thing. And speaking of leadership, wow, what a great way just to honor what somebody is doing. Because when you send them a card to their home and you say, you know, so-and-so, I love how you did this. I love watching you grow. I just have so much respect for the way you manage this process. Thank you for being on the team. Not only do they see that, but they get to open that in the presence of their loved ones. So think how that elevates the way that they feel. It's really similar to sending somebody flowers at work. It's way better than sending them flowers at home <laughs> because right. know, everyone else sees that you got the flowers, right? Well, I mean, there's so many people that, that, you know, social media is such a big part of life now, but for people who struggle with putting themselves out there on social media, it's still a great tool to be able to see those in your community and the events going on in their life. So even if you're not putting yourself out there, it's a great way to say, oh, they've had a child or they've gotten a job promotion. So it's a, that's a great tool to use um, to keep those relationships going, even if you're not, like you say, putting yourself out there in mass on social media. I love that. It's a great Absolutely. Tip. Social media is where we go to listen. Yeah. You know, oh, um, yeah. I, I, I built um, this, I had a client help them buy a house. It was it was a very easy transaction. There was no friction, which is kind of the worst from a referral perspective because it makes everything look so easy and clean and boom, boom, done, right? And uh, his dog got bit by another dog um, and he posted it on social media. And I sent a card from my dogs to his dog. <laughs> and I said, that... Sorry that, sorry your dog got bit by that B word. <laughs> um, um, you know, and, and it was sent a little dog toy in that. And, and I tell you what, I, and I don't, I didn't do that to get referrals. Let me be very clear. But referrals are the, that relationship went to the next level. All of a sudden we became a lot more friendly. We spent more time together and the referrals started coming as well. So I just think it's about taking what's online in social media, which is anti-social media, and making it as social as we can. Or sending a card that just says, congratulations to your new high school graduate. Or I see Becky's in second grade this year. I just, I, I love watching from afar as she grows up and what a great mom you, whatever, right? It's just about being human. And also everything I say, if that's not you, you find your version of that. Because if it's not you, it won't feel right. It won't be right. In the house cleaning business, we had a checklist and we would leave a checklist of all the different tasks we had done at a customer's house and we would leave it with them at every cleaning. Mm -hmm. And there was about this much space on the bottom of the first page. And we left it there intentionally so that we could just grab a pen out of our apron and we could write a quick note of something we noticed in their home that day. Love so it. we'd say, hey, Mrs. Meekum, I just wanted to compliment you on that new entry rug that you've added to your, your entry. It adds such a touch of color and a little bit of flair. The end. That was it. I love but it. Like you said. That's top that of heart. We got a lot of referrals as a result of just paying attention. And because uh, we were in the customer's homes like every other week, we yeah. saw lots of little things like, oh, hey, you painted this room or you got a new mirror in here. And because we cleaned everything, we would notice when something new would appear. Yeah. You got to clean something new that you didn't have to clean before. But commenting on it made all the difference in the world. And it did add that extra touch. That's beautiful. I love that. And that, that's a wonderful example at Top of Heart. Um, what a beautiful example. Uh, we just we want one of the greatest gifts we can give another human being is to allow them to be seen, mm -hmm. you know, as they really are. Um, so psychologists call it unconditional positive regard, meaning I see you as you are, 
and I accept you as you are. Even though you're not perfect, I accept you as you are. And the ironic thing is, the reason psychologists talk about it and therapists talk about it is because they're helping to, to create change for you. And when we are accepted as we really are, that's actually where the most change happens. So it's not like when you accept somebody as they really are, they go, oh, okay, that's good enough. I'm not going to grow. That's where they feel comfortable enough to start growing. So um, I love that you helped your clients be seen that way in cleaning because that is very easily a transaction-oriented thing. I'm in and out. I got it cleaned. Goodbye. Um, and so when you add that human element, it just changes everything. That's so beautiful. I love that. And by the way, well, if you don't, if you do not insist on every single listing, getting professional cleaning before you list it, you are missing the boat and you are leaving money on the table for your clients and for you. Um, I, I just pay for it across the board. Um, I don't even ask them because then that way I, I can just say it always gets clean rather than saying the hard thing, which is, you know, your house kind of doesn't smell great. We need to clean it. I just say <laughs> every, every house gets a cleaning. And uh, so I love that you have that service. That's brilliant. Well, something you just brought up that's really important, and you talk about psych psychologists helping make a change by accepting you as you are. Psychology 101 tells us that the behavior you reward is the behavior that's repeated. Mm -hmm. So when you accept someone as they are and you celebrate them as I, just as you are today, you just showed up and you're good enough, you're worthy, you're good enough, what happens is they tend to show up more authentically more often. Beautiful. because that behavior is rewarded. And we really want to pay attention to the fact that there are so many things that come out of having that really close connection with somebody, but often we are the ones that encourage that. And so when you encourage that just by accepting people and by celebrating the the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, they, they bring the best version of themselves the next time they mm. show up. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. That, and I, you know, again, we are in the business where we get to do this for people. We get paid to do this for people. Um, I think that that's a great honor we have. You have so many high level ideas here. It's it's so fun listening to you. Um, it reminds me a lot of Stephen Covey's book, The Speed of Trust, of just getting back to those basics and really honoring people for who they are. And then you had mentioned something earlier about reducing friction. Um, reminds me of the book Atomic Habits. Yes. Of just placing things in a place yes. that would reduce that friction so you can actually get it done, having those systems in place. That is so, so brilliant. Um, I love that you have those cards out and available and the pens and the stamps. And um, it's one reason why most realtors don't do these things, right? Right. right. Sure. I mean, it's, green lights. it's like the book Green Lights. Yeah. Prepare, prepare, make life easier. Be ready yeah. to go. Remove yeah. every obstacle. Uh, I can't wait until everyone reads your book. Thank Top you so much. Thank you. I appreciate That'd it. That would be so great and insightful. Um, we'll definitely link it here in the show notes because. Thank you. Um, oh, we're all so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I've loved having this conversation. Um, I can tell that I'm with like minded people, and that's always fun. Well, we can't wait until your course. Um, is available. That's coming up mid next month, correct? Yes, November 28th. So you can go to grantmuller.com um, in coaching and uh, take take a quick assessment. And in return, um, I'll give you a 45 minute session with me that's complimentary. And we'll go through that, see if we're a good fit. And if we are, then we'll talk about the program. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's great getting to know all of you. And I'm excited to add you to my agent community uh, so that we can share some referrals along the way as well. Yeah, but I'm going to expect a birthday card. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yeah, my birthday's next week, so you got to hurry on that. Yeah, we're going to really step it up. Yeah. You got to really step it up. But I, I, I always learned, learned so much here, and I really loved it. Real estate is so much about relationships, and I really um, – it, it, your book, Top of Mind, takes the practices that most of us have, but makes us mindful of them and mindful of the relationships that we have and what we bring to our clients and those we work with. So thank you for sharing that. Oh. And uh, I'm just so impressed with your journey and good for you. And what an inspiration it's been to hear it and to see you turn your life around and to give back to others who helped you get to where you are today. Well, yes, thank you thank so you. much for sharing. Very, very inspirational and encouraging. And thank you for your authenticity. 
it is it is fun to hear someone that is so authentic and genuinely themselves. Thank where you. can we find you, Grant? Where can everyone find you online, find your books, your resources, your courses? So again, grantmuller.com is the best place to start. And um, we we just updated it yesterday. So if you find any funny little things that we need to fix, please let me know. Um, but uh, grantmuller.com, you can find everything there, a link to the book, uh, my coaching, a speaking. Um, if if you have if you look, have a conference uh, or an event that you'd like me to speak at, I'm also available that way as well. I just want to get this message out. Um, it's just critical to me that I share this message with as many people as possible. I talk to too many realtors, salespeople, entrepreneurs that are really struggling to make something happen because they're they're trying to do some copy and paste method that just doesn't feel right for who they really are. So thank you for helping me share the word. And I've learned so much from you guys as well. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Angela, where can we find you online? I'm at Ask Angela Brown on all the social medias. And thank you so much, Grant, for being here today. This was awesome. Sure, absolutely. Brooke, where can we find you? I'm Brooke Bryant. I'm a realtor in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And you can find me on social media at Ask Brooke Bryant. Well, thank you all so, so much for being here. We so appreciate each and every one of you. That was so insightful and fun. We hope to get you on again soon.